So I'd like to begin today's sermon by looking back. While writing this sermon, I learned that a few years ago, one of my most influential teachers died. It was he that introduced me to the thinking of the Jewish mystic and philosopher, Martin Buber. This is an introduction that affected me in a most profound way. And so I would like to dedicate this sermon to the memory of Professor Ken Morrison and the hope and confidence that there will be and are others like him. Still looking back, I want to summarize some of the themes of the last four or five <coughs> sermons I've delivered here. They are related to one another and serve as a basis for the next few sermons. Lo and behold. So, uh, here we go. Reader's Digest condensed version of the last five sermons. <laughs> our consciousness is surfing an existential wave of our interconnected circumstance and pre-conscious actions. We steer the board, but do not make the wave. What influence we exert over the board, over our future, comes from the stories we tell in our culture and about our personal histories. One of the major circumstances that form us is the story of our open source religion. Meanwhile, ideas and life are forces unto themselves that animate us. Identifying with these forces expands our identity in what is often thought of as spiritual experience. <clears throat> So all that makes the individual seem kind of insignificant. Kind of takes the air out of a person or personhood. If I'm just a vessel for something bigger than me to experience itself without much say in my own alleged choices, then what's the point? Why should I care? Well, one answer might be because <clears throat> nothing less than reality depends on it. The world depends on it. Your life and the quality of your life and possibly the quality of life itself depend on you. It depends on how much of a person you experience yourself as being. And that brings us directly to Martin Buber and his little book, I and Thou. The first two pages of this book are dense and stunning. And I will read them to you now. To man, the world is twofold in accordance with his twofold attitude. The attitude of man is twofold in accordance with the twofold nature of the primary words which he speaks. The primary words are not isolated words, but combined words. The one primary word is the combination I, thou. The other primary word is the combination I, it. Wherein, without a change, in the primary word, one of the words he and she can replace it. Hence, the I of man is also twofold. For the I of the primary word I thou is a different I from that of the primary word I it. Primary words are spoken from the being. If thou is said, the I of the combination I-thou is said along with it. If it is said, the I of the combination I-it is said along with it. The primary word I-thou can only be spoken with the whole being. The primary word I-it can never be spoken with the whole being. So basically, Buber is saying that identity and experience, in other words, our lives as we know it, is relationship. You are 
how you relate. Your experience of the world is determined by how you relate. You can relate with empathy and respect, or you can relate with ignorance and objectification. A being in a world of depth, breadth, and vibrancy, or a one-dimensional thing. So this map of reality sounds like but goes way beyond the sacred and profane polarity. Whereas the sacred and profane puts the object or event in the center, say a Torah scroll or an ego or the Eucharist, I thou and I it puts the relationship at the center. And this changes the definition of person. You are not a substance so much as a way, a way of relating. You are a flow of innumerable relationships. And we keep telling ourselves the story that we are each our own individual, autonomous, uncontingent, and in control of our own reactions that will determine our own destiny. In that story, personhood equates with authority. And in many ways, that's a valuable and useful story. But as I've already described in prior sermons, that turns out not to be so testably true. Rather, perhaps we should tell the story of a shared reality where we are defined as a person not by our authority or autonomy, but by the quality of the way in which we relate to all that we encounter. Which would be fine if we were able to control how we relate. However, it has been demonstrated time and again that we relate, decide, and act prior to our intending to do so. This would suggest that we have little hope of intentionally directing how we relate. So what do we do? So I've been reading a book, which was assigned to me by Meg Kidwell, <laughs> called The Righteous Mind, by a professor from the University of Virginia by the name of uh, Jonathan Haidt. And recorded in this wonderful book are some of his tests, which corroborate the pre-conscious action idea. And these have inspired him to come up with the metaphor of elephant and rider. The elephant is our intuition, our gut, our automatic processes. The rider is our reasoning, our consciousness, or intent. The intuitive elephant has its own intelligence and desire and is obviously far more powerful than the rider. However, Haight argues that the rider, consciousness, intent, evolved and survived because, like eyes and legs, it does in fact do something good for the elephant. Speculating about the future, for instance. The human elephant needs a conscious, a conscious rider. However, this still means that our consciousness serves our intuition. So some of Haight's tests involve stories that elicited moral judgment without moral reasoning. This proves the elephant is in control. So uh, in one test, he he told about a woman who is a vegetarian for moral reasons. And she works in a hospital pathology lab where she is asked to incinerate a dead body. Thinking it wasteful to throw away edible flesh, she cuts off a piece, takes it home, cooks it, and eats it. The question is, was that morally wrong? Most people say, yes, that was morally wrong, but then have a difficult time of coming up with a reasonable explanation 
as to why. And yet, the fact that they cannot explain why does not change their conclusions. So this is just one of many examples where hate found that the elephant is moving, regardless of the writer. So our consciousness is, is by and large at the mercy of our intuition, which in turn is the product of genetic and social evolution, as well as personal histories. In other words, intuition is the product of genetic experience and survival over eons. I'll say that again. Intuition is the product of genetic experience and survival over eons, social experience and survival over thousands of years, and personal experience and survival in our lifetimes. Each of those kinds of experience, or any kind of experience really, is, as Buber observed, relational. So while it may be true that how we relate is the purview of our intuition, our intuition is shaped in turn by how we relate, which is a circular proposition. But there is a wild card, the writer. Spiritually and psychologically speaking, a person is the product of the relationship between the writer and the elephant, the conscious and the unconscious, and their combined relationship with the world. It is possible for us to be spiritually full persons through the partnership between our intuition and reason. That is to say, through our whole being, Mr. Buddha. However, when we are acting as only reason, fat chance, <laughs> or as only intuition, a much better bet, then we are not relating to the world with our whole being, and the possibility for us to become a whole person vanishes. The possibility for our world to be a vibrant and a live place in which we are personally engaged vanishes. I, it, is then the only way for us to be, a way of fracture, brittleness, objectification, breakage, and loneliness. Not a great travel brochure, although it's very popular. And yet because the elephant of intuition is doing all the relating the experience of I thou is not in our control. Intuition is not subject to our authority. It is mostly accidental, mostly serendipitous, mostly luck, mostly genetic, or in more religious terms, it is grace. Beyond that, even if the elephant is gracefully disposed to yearn for I thou, Intuition is not our whole being. The writer and the elephant need to be on the same page. So three pieces of good news. One, grace abounds. Grace abounds. You are, after all, here. Existentially and locally. And that is only the beginning. Grace abounds so abundantly that the only thing between you and it is awareness. And awareness is the jurisdiction of consciousness. Two, sometimes by grace, the writer and elephant are momentarily in integrated already. And that integration presumably has a satisfying effect and an attraction to both writer and elephant for more of it. Three, when that is not the case, the elephant, mighty as it is, can be observed, can be understood. It can be calmed. While control may be impossible, Influence 
is available. Integration of intuition and intent is doable. And we have already taken the first steps towards its doing. Thank the elephant. Turns out that according to Haight's research, while our elephant won't listen to our writer, it will listen to other friendly writers and friendly elephants. <coughs> Interaction, he observes, yields revision. Revision integrates writer and elephant. Revision forces intuition and intent <coughs> to work together. This is your chosen herd. <coughs> and this is why diversity is so important. This is the advantage of communities that, that are diverse and are also somehow cohesive. No mean trick. So our word bond, our covenant, our welcoming each other allows us, when we are at our best, to understand different points of view in a generous manner, from an unthreatened posture. Here is the place where the practice of mercy and the awareness of grace may be put first. Now, in such a happy circumstance, our intuition will lean into the invitation and entertain the disposition of the other, but also exploring its own presumptions in a way that is very difficult to do outside the influence of the herd. Our diversity will protect us from the tyranny of the mob, while the mob will protect us from the tyranny of our ego. For our community holds us accountable. And hate demonstrates that accountability also influences the elephant. And so it is in community where the possibility for the integration of intuition and intent is increased and also refined. And this integration makes it possible to speak with our whole being. Community makes I vow more likely, both within that community and beyond its walls. The existence brought about is then vibrant, alive, and personally engaged. how to create that community and what kind of community to create. These become essential questions. And for that, my friends, you'll need to come back next week. <laughs> Today, you become a person. Next week is becoming a community and then becoming the world. When thou is spoken, writes Buber, the speaker has no thing for his object. For where there is a thing, there is another thing. Every it is bounded by others. It exists only through being bounded by others. But when thou is spoken, there is no thing. Thou has no bounds. When thou is spoken, the speaker has no thing. He has indeed nothing but he takes his stand in relation. Thank you, Professor Morrison.